know your name, I know you great Yeah, 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 yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just trying to serve, Lord, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way, but I know you. To calm in expectation, we're not just going through the motions today. We come to meet and serve a living God. And so, calm in expectation, and that you're going to be blessed by today's service. Just a few house rules before I go along. Uh, just remember to turn off your phones or keep it on silent so that we don't disrupt today's worship. And also, today's duty deacon is our lovely Joyce. Joyce is just walking over there with a lovely flowery dress, looking very summery. <laughs> uh, if you've got any questions about the service, please don't hesitate to ask her any questions. Now, I have a quiz. Today's going to be, I've got a couple of questions for people. Do, does anyone know what today is? Oh, you guys are good. It is Father's Day. Um, and also, it's like, this is the second year in a row that I'm hosting Father's Day. So I don't know who whoever's organizing is trying to tell me something. I don't know what's going on here, but um, happy Father's Day. We're going to be honoring them and celebrating them later in the service. Um, so we're just going to pray for them and all the good stuff. And so, yeah, that's going to be going on. So just before I invite the worship team um, to get started, I just wanted to really encourage you to come with hearts open this morning and to really understand the meaning of worship. We're not just singing songs, we're praising our living God. Psalm 34, verse 3 says, Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. There's a difference when we're all here together in one accord. Our Lord Jesus is here. So let us treat this with reverence and worship. So you feel free to sing, feel free to dance, feel free to do whatever you want. But let's just come in expectation. So let, let's stand, and we're just going to stand. As we stand, let's just go into a time of prayer. Father, we welcome you in our midst this morning. We thank you that we have the privilege to come before you as a people and to serve the living God. We thank you for this time. We thank you for today. We thank you that we are even here, Lord. Some people slept and they didn't, wake up this, they didn't wake up this morning, but Father, we have the privilege to be in your presence this morning, and we don't take that lightly. So, Father, we come with open hearts. Your word says that we should worship in spirit and in truth. So, Father, Holy Spirit, calm down, Lord. If there's anything that we're still thinking of, Father, examine our hearts, Lord, and let us bow down and worship you this morning. And, Father, we just pray, Lord, that we, as we said, we come in expectation to meet with you. So, Father, move in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Worship team, take it away.
Thank you, worship team, for leading us so beautifully. Church, you know what time it is. Please greet one another. Say hello to a familiar face, those you haven't seen for a while. And yeah, let's just fellowship for the five minutes or so. Yes, let's start to make our way. It's always so interesting watching this on stage. It's almost like you guys prefer this part of the service than the actual sermon. You love it, don't you? You love it. Anyways, <laughs> church, we're just going to go through a time of some notices. Uh, first one is, if you are a church member, it was announced at a church members meeting uh, last week, Sunday, um, you should have all received a welcome email to the newly church box database. Um, if you haven't received the email or you're having any problems with access, please speak to Liz or Denzel um, if you've got any questions, but you should have all received that email. Second notice, who loves a good church barbecue? Yeah? Oh, you, that doesn't sound too exciting. Well, we have a church barbecue coming up. Um, it, I believe it's on the 13th, Saturday, the 13th of July at 3 p.m. It's going to be in the church and meet in room one. The weather, we are praying and fasting that it's going to be really, really sunny and it's going to be an amazing day. Oh, 1 p.m. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah, 1 p.m. Don't come at 3 p.m. The food's going to be done, um, <laughs> especially when we have Denzel about. So <laughs> make sure you come at 1 p.m. Church barbecue, invite friends, invite family. It's going to be a lovely time. We haven't had one of these in a long time, so it would be absolutely amazing to see everyone there. Uh, one more notice, I believe. Does anyone know what the, where the phrase, the writing on the wall, comes from? By the way, this question is open to men only, and I have a gift. It's Father's Day, come on. It's not everyday sisterhood. Um, <laughs> does anyone know where the phrase... The writing on the wall comes from. I have, a, I have a great prize. Denzel has a million pounds for you. Does anyone want to answer? No, no, no. You, you, can't, you can't cheat. Women are... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on someone. I'm going to pick on someone. I'm going to ask Reese. Do you know where it comes from? No. You don't? Well, you would have if you come to the men's Bible study. Men, men's Bible study is on a bi-weekly. It's on Thurs it's Thursdays at 7.30. I strongly, strongly encourage you um, to come. We only have around, like, last time I came, there was only, like, three members. Sorry, three people and three quarters of them don't even come to this church. On a serious level, that is a poor statistic. So, church, I implore you, I encourage you. Men's Bible study, this is an important thing. This is where we fellowship together. There is accountability, there's community, um, and most importantly, it's actually fun. Like, we've gone through Ecclesiastes, we've gone through um, Daniel, we've gone through Ephesians. Right now, we're going through Daniel, and the phrase, the writing on the wall, I didn't even know that came from Daniel chapter 5, so it's just an eye-opener for me. So I strongly encourage you um, to come. It's going to be on this Thursday. I'm not going to be there. England are playing priorities and all that, but... <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'll be there, I'll be there. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, I strongly encourage you to come. Now, where are all our fathers in the house? Can we all stand up, please? Fathers, this is my time to embarrass you. In fact, come and join me on stage. Come and join me on stage. If you're a father figure, just play the role of a father, can you please come and join me on stage? Fatherhood is so important, um, as we've seen with many stories in the Bible. I feel like I shouldn't be on stage. I'm not a father. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> I'm you. Um, <laughs> can we give them a big round of applause, please? Thank you, church. It's always important to honor um, the men in our lives, and 
Father's Day is such a great example. Well, we know that, I mean, secretly, we all know we prefer Mother's Day. But anyways, <laughs> let's not just, you know, give them a happy Father's Day mug. Let's celebrate and honor the wonderful impacts that these men make in lives. Um, and we just want to celebrate you and honor you today. So we're going to pray for each and every man and every um, coming father. So let's just spend some time in prayer honoring and thanking God for their lives. Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you that we can celebrate these men. We thank you for the roles they have played, Lord. We thank you that you've given the grace to see their, their role through, Lord. We thank you for the many years of sacrifice, Lord, um, and the impact and the wisdom and the daily disciplines they have put into their children, Lord. Father, your word says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will, he will not forget it. And Father, I'm thankful that I have had that impact in my life. And so, Father, we just thank you for these men. We pray, Lord, that you continue to bless them. We thank you that you continue to give them the strength um, to continue to sometimes... Society doesn't really appreciate or admire what they do, Lord. But, Father, we, we know that we have a heavenly Father that, that looks and builds these men up, Lord. So, Father, we pray for the next generation of men in coming, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will build our boys up with the heavenly wisdom in Scripture. We pray, Lord, that you will raise godly men, men of fortitude, men of courage, men who are leaders, men who are ready to serve. We pray, Lord, that we as a community must do better, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you for these men. We pray, Lord, that you continue to give them strength. And as they go on and on, that they, you just fill them with wisdom as they continue their roles, Lord. We thank you for their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. You may be seated. Have I missed any notices, Liz? Am I good? All good? Sisterhood? <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, church, we're now going to go into a time of prayer. Um, this is typically a time uh, where we just pray for our world. We pray for what's in our heart. We pray for our church family. Um, so, yeah, if you just quiet down your hearts and settle your hearts and let's have a conversation with Abba Father. Today I was in the true spirit of Father's Day. I was just thinking of not only fathers, I mean everyone here under the sound of my voice, we all have a father, we all have a heavenly father, but we don't all, we don't all have the same experience um, with our fathers. And so, Father, on this day, I mean, just think of that, that we even have the privilege to say, Abba, Father, our heavenly father in heaven. In Jeremiah, it says, I knew you before you were in the womb. Your Father knows us. He knows us before we even came down on this earth, Lord. And so, Father, I pray for those who today is bringing a, a sad memory or mixed memory or they have, they've had absent early, um, earthly fathers. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give us the strength and just... I pray, Lord, for those who are feeling like that today, Lord, that they know that they have a heavenly Father in you who is always here, who has been here before us, Lord, who, who has known us. I pray, Lord, that you just send your comfort and send your love, and we are claimed, we are loved by you, Lord. So, Father, I just pray for those who are hurting today, those who are having mixed experiences, and we're sensitive to that nature, Lord. But we're also hopeful and we're also thankful that we have a heavenly father that we can call to at any time. Father, we also pray for our men in our community, our young boys. Father, we all know what the stats say, how they're being raised to be someone else. They're, they're following the ways of the world. We, we know about the Andrew Tates of this world. But Father, we just pray, Lord, for the influence. We know how fatherhood is so impactful, Lord. So, Father, we pray for our young men in schools. We pray, Lord, that they will be led the correct way, Lord. We pray, Lord, that they will be led by the scripture. We pray, Lord, that those who are on the wrong road, they will be impacted and you will make a change in their lives, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we as a community, we do all we can to raise young men of God, people who strive to lay their lives down and sacrifice just us the way you sacrifice, Lord. 
It's a heavy calling, but it's a calling that we are as men called to do. So, Father, we pray, Lord, for your strength. We pray, Lord, for wisdom. Teach us, Lord, to raise young men. Help us, Lord, to work, to work in schools, to work in our homes. We know it starts in the home, Lord. So, Father, help us, Lord. Give us your spirit. Let us build these daily disciplines, Lord, the habit of prayer, the habit of communing with you, the, the habit of just being involved, Lord. We hand over all these things, Lord, and pray, Lord, that we can be prepare the next generation so that they do not go astray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I believe it's time for the kids to go out now. Are they going out? Yes, they are going out. <laughs> this is always that awkward time. And the youth, sorry, and the youth. Okay. Who's been enjoying the series of John so far? One person. Oh, hello. Well, today we're going to be blessed. I'm excited to, to uh, see what God has for us in store today. But before we do that, church, as we stand for the reading of the word, I invite Reese to come and do the reading of the word in John chapter 8, verse 12 to 38. Morning, church. So I'm reading from John 8, 12 to 38. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I come from and where I am going but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, they said to him therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him because his, ha his hour had not come yet. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said to him, we will kill him, since he says, where am I going? You cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am you, that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are the offspring of Abraham, and, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because of my word. It finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, 
and you do what you have heard from your father. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his words. Thank you, Reese. As I invite David to come and share the word, church, you may be seated. <laughs> Just going to pray right now for David. Father, we thank you for this privilege, Lord. We thank you for your son. Father, we pray, Lord, that you may speak through him, Lord. I pray, Lord, may the Holy Spirit speak through him. I pray, Lord, that you, what you, we want to hear from you, Lord. We don't want to hear from David. And so, Father, as he's prepared, Lord, I pray, Lord, for open hearts, I pray, Lord, that our hearts are receptive to hear your word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we just don't simply go through the motions, Lord, but we understand, Lord. Father, give us the wisdom, and I just pray for him, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you give him boldness. I pray, Lord, that you give him strength. I pray, Lord, that you calm any nerves, and that he's, as he's been called, he's simply doing your will, Lord, sharing the gospel. In all these things, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got like, thank you. Appreciate you. Good morning, church. Good morning, morning, morning. Good to see you guys. Hope you're all well. Church, as always, I want to first by, start by giving thanks to God for the opportunity to share with you from his word. As you know, it's something I do not take lightly at all whatsoever. And so, Sajia, thank you so much, brother, for the prayers. Again, this way, we've committed this into God's hands. And so I'm trusting that he will deliver this message to you and not me. Amen? Amen, amen. Just going to set up here. All right, so church, this morning I'm going to be really vulnerable with you and tell you a bit about my childhood and how I remember growing up being extremely afraid of the dark. Uh, I don't know, I just managed to convince myself that monsters were real and that they were out to get me. Just me, no one else. But I'm sure most of us can relate. Being in darkness is pretty frightening. Not only is your vision restricted and in most cases gone, but consider nighttime is often when the wicked thrive. I also remember that every time that we had a power cut, not only was I afraid, but the people around me became extremely anxious and it almost always resulted in a chaotic atmosphere. In fact, I quite remember being about five years old. I had just landed in Ghana and at the airport, there was a power cut. And I remember this being such a huge deal because how often do you get a power cut at an airport? And I remember it was so chaotic, everyone was saying, light off, light off, because in Ghana, when there's a power cut, they say, light off, light off, is the thing over there. <laughs> but when that would happen, it would only affect the area that it was. If this building right now was to have a power cut, it's more than likely not going to hear the rest of Croydon complaining. But on the flip side, if this building was the only building with light in the UK, it does nothing for the rest of the country buried in darkness. If America was the only country with light, it does nothing for the rest of the world buried in darkness. Church, if I take out my phone right now and I turn on this torch, even though it's brighter than an iPhone, you can see that it doesn't go that far, does it? Sorry, I'm not trying to start anything. <laughs> but the fact is, this light is restricted. It can only go so far. And so this should put into perspective the bold claim that Jesus Christ made about himself. You see, Jesus didn't say, I am a light in Jerusalem. He didn't say, I am a light in Samaria. But he took it further and made a claim that no one else can make. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. This is a bold claim. And in a moment, we're going to unpack not only what this means, but who he was saying it to and the opposition that he was faced with. And just to give you a heads up, I might spend most of my time unpacking verse 12, but we'll try and move on as much as humanly possible. So let's dig in. John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, church, just to recap, Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles, which is an annual Jewish event in which Jews would gather from around the world to celebrate God's goodness, his kindness, his provision and faithfulness, uh, towards them. They are remembering how God was with them and faithful to them during their wilderness experience. And so they get together to express their gratitude for all that God has done. So when it says again, Jesus spoke to them, it's referring to the gathered Jews, the multitude of people who have come for this event. Jesus is crying out to them. 
And we know this from chapter 7, verse 37, where it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, at this event, there were several ceremonial practice that would be taking place. For example, there would be something called the water libation ceremony, where the high, priest would, the high priest would pour out water into a special basin on the altar. This was to recall prophecies like in Isaiah when God promises to pour water on the dry land. It was also to remember how God was faithful to make it rain during dry seasons and how he was good to provide water in the wilderness. And so whilst this is going on, this is when Jesus is saying, if anyone thirsts, drink from me. This is, he's pointing it back to me. So these practices are taking place and he's saying this. And he promised that if you drink from him, you'll be satisfied. Now, during this feast was also something that was called the temple illumination or the illumination of the temple, where there will be four large uh, uh, menorahs or candelabras that would stand on the temple platform. And it is said that when these were lit, it was so bright that it would light up the entire city of Jerusalem. Now, this was to symbolize how God was the light for the children of Israel. And most Jews also see it as a reminder that God promised to one day send the Messiah to renew Israel's glory. Now, it's with this same voice that Jesus is now saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, he's saying this boldly. He's saying this with urgency, knowing, by the way, the opposition that he may face, but the truth must be spoken. It's amazing. Today, we have open-air preachers where they are pointing people to Christ. But here Christ is, in the first century, open-air preaching, pointing people to himself. And so he should. I mean, Scripture is about him. These practices, what they're remembering, how God was good, is all about him. I mean, ch church, notice the pattern, the sequence, if you haven't already. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, in reference to the manna that fell from heaven and fed the children of Israel. The very next chapter, he says, if you first drink from me, in reference to the water that was provided in the wilderness. The very next chapter, now we're on John 8, he is now saying he is the light of the world. And see, we're not going to only explore how this in, in, relef, in relation to Tanakh, but also what it means for us today. But let's spend some few moments just unpacking the importance of light. You see, without light, not only are you in darkness, but it often means you're in danger. You see, the call of Jesus here isn't to religion, but to safety. Church, the moment you recognize what God is doing through his son, Jesus, and how he is indeed the light unto the prophets, that the, unto the nations that the prophets spoke of, the more you understand the heartbeat of the gospel and these claims that Jesus Christ is making about himself. I remember watching this film called 47 Meters Down, where a group of people wanted to see sharks up close. Now, I don't know why people want to see sharks up close, knowing that they can eat you, but apparently this is a thing that people do. I know, it's weird. But they went in a cage, and the deeper they went into the ocean, the chain that was holding the cage snapped, and they plunged 47 meters into the ocean. Now, as you can imagine, the rest of the film is about survival, but there was one scene in particular where this girl managed to escape the cage and try and find help. But the further she got into the ocean, the more she got lost, and her vision was taken from her. She could no longer see. She became gripped with panic and fear and hopeless until she saw the light. Now, full of joy, she swam towards that light. And I remember that not only gave her hope, but it gave me hope. Why am I saying this? Church, we live in a dark world in which people are lost. People are hopeless, in danger, seeking, waiting to be found, waiting to be rescued. But Jesus Christ has made himself available in a way that no other man has and no other man can. How? By being the light that all men should run to. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In light, there is hope. In light, there is salvation. In light, there is no darkness. In light, there is safety. In light, there is vision and sight. In light, there is security. You don't have to walk in darkness not knowing which way to turn. You don't have to walk in darkness and have your vision taken away from you. Jesus Christ has made it clear that this ain't no ordinary light. It is the light of life. Isn't that what John says at the start of this book? John chapter 1 verse 4. In him was life 
and that life was the light of all mankind? Isn't this the light that the prophet spoke of? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Here he is, the light himself. Isn't it true that David in Psalm chapter 27, verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and salvation, whom shall I fear? There is security in light and thus a security in Christ. This verse also throws us back to Exodus chapter 13. When the children of Israel were leaving uh, Egypt, they were follow, following a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, which gave them light. So church, picture if you will, you're a traveler on a journey at night. Jesus Christ is saying that he is that light. And that if you follow him, you will not travel through this journey of life in darkness. It's amazing, isn't it? The psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we know this is scripture, but isn't it true? Jesus is the very word of God became flesh. Remember, church, this light also exposes the wickedness of man. In my first sermon, I mentioned that this is why the world hates Jesus, because him being the light exposes the wickedness that they do in secret. Jesus said, light has come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil, John 3, 19. So when Jesus says, whoever follows him, i.e. the light, will not walk in darkness, it's also to say that as you follow this light, you will subsequently turn your back on darkness. You are following him, and so you've turned your back on the wicked life that you used to live. Because how many of you know, you cannot live in both light and darkness for what fellowship does light? have with darkness. So all of this is making someone very angry. Not only is this light, uh, light that saves and rescues, but it's light that takes people out of the kingdom of darkness and brings them into the kingdom of God who is light. And so someone, i.e. Satan, is going to be mad. I mean, church, think about it. If it's true that Jesus is indeed this light that guides people who are lost, what do you think Satan's going to do in response to his claim? I mean, God tells man, do not eat from this tree. The day you eat, you will surely die. Satan comes and says, you won't surely die. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Satan says, there's many ways to the Father. And now Jesus is here saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And here come the Pharisees echoing the ways of their father, the devil, in verse 13. <clears throat> so the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Sounding just like their lying father, the devil, who wants mankind to remain in darkness. Notice, church, they're not even asking him. They're, they're telling him. It's almost as though these Jews can perhaps see their students in the, in the crowd and they are being captivated by the words of Jesus. And so they're about to be saved. But because of their jealousy, because of their hatred for the light, they couldn't stand it and they wanted to destruct this. They are being a great hindrance. This is none other than the work of Satan. As a matter of fact, the very fact that Jesus was opposed and faced opposition actually proves his claim to be true. Because why would Satan bother putting you down if he doesn't see you as a threat? How is what Jesus is saying here actually harmful? And if anything, these people should actually listen and believe what he's saying. Do they think that Jesus doesn't know who he's saying this to and who he's speaking to? You see, Jesus wouldn't make this claim if it wasn't true. He is speaking to first century Jews that would kill you in a heartbeat. But Jesus is saying this because it is true. And so people can be saved. I'm again reminded of C.S. Lewis, Lord, liar or lunatic. Think about it. If Jesus is a rabbi and he's able to teach in a synagogue, then we know he can't be mad. They would have never let that happen. He's, so he's not a lunatic. We know that. And we also know not only does he not lie, but he, there's no reason for him to lie. Why would he lie? I mean, think about it. There was no reason. He knew the implications that would happen to him if he was to lie, especially as a first century rabbi. So we know he's not a liar. We know he's not a lunatic. So there's only one option. He is who he said he is. He is the light of the world. And if you reject this light, where does that leave you? But in darkness. 
And since we know that this is the same light that guided the children of Israel out of Egypt, this means that if you reject this light, you are rejecting the guidance of Christ. And so you remain lost in this dark world. But not only that, you remain lost, full stop. The Jews had it right in front of them, and they rejected it. And so if you're listening, and you haven't accepted or come to this light, please do not do the same as they did. They challenged him. He said, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Practicing this tradition and this is blinding them from seeing what Jesus has said and is saying. You see, the Pharisees are appealing to the law in Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. But this is how you know these guys aren't being honest and that they just hate Jesus, this straight-talking preacher. They, they pick and choose how and when they want to apply the law. Because remember, isn't it true that the priests and Levites went to John the Baptist and said, what do you say about yourself? I mean, if they're being consistent, why does it matter what he says about himself? They just hate Jesus. They cannot stand him, and they're trying hard to silence him. But Jesus gives a powerful response in verse 14. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. See, these religious leaders are letting this custom, this tradition, blind them from seeing what and who is in front of them. But not only that, church, if they were paying attention, Jesus has already told them that he has witnesses in chapter 5. John the Baptist, his miraculous works, God the Father, the scriptures. But Jesus is saying, look, listen, whether or not there are two or three witnesses, what I am saying is actually true. Perhaps for someone else making this claim, you can apply this law, but let God be true and every man a liar. I am the light of the world. And I can say this confidently because I know where I came from and where I am going. Jesus is conscious of himself and his authority. He is confident. He is not uncertain. He is not unsure about who he is. Put someone else to the test and see how they crumble. Why would Jesus make this claim if he didn't know it to be true? Verse 15 and 16. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. There are two ways to approach this. One way is that Jesus is not judging by fleshly standards as they are. But this also means that Jesus is not judging anyone yet. And we know this from John chapter 3, verse 17, where it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Other translations say to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. What these guys aren't understanding is that this is a great opportunity for them to be saved. They are standing in front of him, Christ, the light of the world, the one who saves, the bread of life, the long-awaited Messiah. But all they're doing is just judging them according to this custom. I mean, this is how the devil often distracts people. You can have the truth right in front of you, but for some reason you need more or you don't like how something is said or, or done. You see, I realize Satan doesn't care how you see Jesus as long as you don't see him for who he really is. Church, examine yourself. Perhaps there is something that is veiling you like these Jews uh, were veiled, in which you can't see Jesus. Perhaps it's an experience and all certain traditions, and it's hindering you from seeing the truth, the light, the true Christ. Their eyes were covered by their hatred, jealousy, custom, tradition. Church, don't let that be you. Verse 17 to 19. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. I love how Jesus addresses these people. He not only knows the culture, the custom, the language, the scriptures, but he knows them more than they know themselves. He created them. He said, okay, let's play your game. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I bear witness about myself, but guess what? The father who sent me bears witness about me. 
Now, this is a serious statement because what Jesus has just done is he's actually proved to them, using their law, how what he is saying is true. And so if they continue to reject this light, they're in big trouble. Jesus also claiming that the Father sent him is a huge deal because in Torah, the Jews would have been familiar with how God told Moses, tell Pharaoh, I am has sent me to you. Being sent meant, meant that you were on a mission, an assignment. It meant that you had a message. You see, the Jews should have inquired, okay, so you, you said you've been sent. What is your mission? But they were focused. All they were focused on is trying to discredit Jesus. And so they asked him, where is your father? Now, I think this is so childish, and I'm sure you will too once you understand what they were saying here. It almost reminds me of in school when someone was, was confronted about something that was true. The person would be so embarrassed that all they could respond is, your mum. That's their only response. <laughs> now, scholars actually often point out that when the Jews said this, they said it with an intent to harm and cut Jesus. And they said, where is your father? This is what there was, uh, it was known that there was some sarcasm in that question. And basically, it was in reference to the controversy uh, in relation to his virgin birth, and basically addressing the rumours that it was not a miraculous conception, but an impure one. And so they thought that this would catch Jesus off guard, that this would crumble him, that would wound him. But no, it backfired on them badly. You see, they were trying to say to Jesus, you don't know your father. And this is coming from people who took pride in thinking that they know their father and that God was their father. But watch how Jesus shatters them and tells them something that is more cutting and damaging for them than they intended for him. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And really quickly, church, do you hear the echo there? What does that remind you of? He tells Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Jesus is consistent with his claim to deity. But this is cutting, because remember in John chapter 5, verse 18, it mentions that the Jews picked up stones to stone him because he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So they would have known that this is what Jesus meant when he said this. It was with their mind, like they knew that when Jesus said this, it was with the mind that he's calling God his father. So when he says, you know neither me nor my father, what he's really saying is, you don't know me, you don't know God. You see, church, I can boldly tell you, if you don't know Christ, you don't know God. Which, by the way, is true. If you don't know Christ and you have a wrong idea of Christ, you cannot actually call God your father. Jesus says, no one comes to the father except through me. And he's very clear with that. So I can tell you, if you don't know Christ, you don't know God. But I can never tell you, if you don't know me, David, you don't know God. I can never say that. Who am I? I'm just a boy from Pollard Hill. <laughs> Yet Jesus is saying this with no remorse. He's making himself equal with God the Father. Now at this point, you can imagine the anger of the Jews. If you remember in Acts 7, when they were stoning Jesus, it described them as gnashing their teeth. These people were furious. They were aggressive. They were to be feared, honest. They could kill you in a heartbeat. But he's saying this confidently. But guess what? In verse 20, it said that although they wanted to arrest them, they couldn't because his hour had not yet come. Let's read verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. The author... It's very intelligent how he's written this because he says these words, which words? These controversial sayings, these claims, these things that he was saying about himself, he spoke whilst he was in the treasury. Now, why is that important? Why is it important to highlight that? Because the treasury was considered the most public place in Jerusalem, right on the Temple Mount. And so many people were hearing Jesus say this. It's like, Lord, what a time to make such statements, right? But even after he said these things, no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. This shows the sovereignty of God. This shows that the Messiah had to be arrested the way the prophets foretold it. He had to be crucified the way Tanakh foretold it. It also confirms Jesus' words in John chapter 10, which we'll see as we go through this book. He says, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and power to pick it back up. 
He tells Pilate, you have no authority over me except that which is given to you from above. Church, the only reason that Jesus was arrested is because his hour had come. And he announced it himself. He says, and now the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand, hands of sinners. But get this, church. The heart of the reason why Jesus was eventually arrested was to redeem you and me. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Such was the willingness of our Lord, that although he could disappear, and although he could save himself, he gave himself up for us. Verse 21 to 24. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He said, I am going away. Church, doesn't that just give you chills? Here is a man pleading for people to come to him. This light that was in front of them is now saying that he's going away. This means the opportunity to be saved is gradually being taken away. And here is also a man telling these religious leaders that they will die in their sins. What a statement to make. For who can say such a thing but God? But he goes on to say, where I am going, you cannot come. To which they respond, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. See, the Jews are so blinded by their arrogance and their hatred for the light that they've missed it again. Let me explain to you what's going on here. They thought that Jesus was going to commit suicide. And there was this Jewish understanding that when a person commits suicide, they would go straight to hell. And so in their mind, they thought, well, if Jesus is going to hell, that means that's why he's saying we cannot go where he's going because we are so self-righteous. We are so righteous that we can't be going to hell. Such was their ignorance and self-righteous. But Jesus corrects this thinking by telling them, no, in verse 23, it says, he said to them, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. What a claim to deity. He flips it though, and he goes on to say, I told you, we're going to come back to those words, I told you. He says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Church, he says, I told you, I told you. This is important because this shows that they cannot get to God in judgment today and tell God they were never told. If you haven't believed, you cannot get to God and tell him you haven't been told. Jesus is clear. I told you. I told you through the evangelists. I told you through the preachers. I told you through the scriptures. I told you through your friends. I told you through your family. Unless you believe, in him, you will die in your sins. But Jesus makes another very crucial statement here. When he says, unless you believe that I am he, in the Greek, there is no he. It's ego eimi. Does anyone know what ego eimi means? Shout it out if you know. I am, right? I am. Now, this isn't the first time Jesus says this. Later on in this chapter, in verse 58, he said this famously, before Abraham was, I am, exactly, ego eimi. But let's go even further back. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh, I am has sent me to you. So the, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, this would have read, ego eimi has sent me to you. But what about the prophets? God also says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Church, you hear the echo. God says in Isaiah, believe, understand, know, 
that I am he, and Jesus is here telling these people, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This is no mistake. He's consistently claiming to be God right in front of them. And in case you're not convinced, what about Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12, where it says, listen to me of Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he, there it is again. I am the first and the last. Who is the first and the last? Jesus, right? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, he claims to be the first and the last. I mean, there are several more examples, but you get my point. Jesus is saying, plainly, look, listen, unless you believe that I am God, you will die in your sins. It's no wonder there's so many false religions like Islam, Jehovah Witnesses, so many people who are trying to strip Jesus away from his deity. They are trying to say that he is not God. Of course, this is what Satan wants you to believe because Jesus has said, unless you believe he is God, you will die in your sins. He is very clear. Unless you believe that I am that I am, unless you believe that I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate for the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, the life, I am the true vine. Unless you believe this about me, you will die in your sins, for salvation is found in no one else. Verse 25 to 30. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the father. So Jesus said to them, when you've lifted up the son of man, this is in reference to his crucifixion, and remember, he tells Nicodemus in chapter 3, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So Christ is talking about when he is lifted up on the cross. He says, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who is with me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Amen? The Jews couldn't take it anymore. Intellectually, he's beaten them. Scripturally, he's beaten them. By power and authority, he's beaten them. They're exhausted, and they could bear it no more until they had to ask, who are you? They've never seen or heard anyone speak like this. And Jesus tells them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I am the light of the world, the bread of life, the one who gives water that will perpetually quench your thirst. He goes on to say that he does nothing on his own authority, but speak just as the Father taught him. Reference John chapter 7, verse 16, when Jesus says, my teaching is not of my own, it's not my own, but his who sent me, you know, the Father who you say you know, he is behind these words too. And so rejecting me, is rejecting him. He's not left me alone. But church, get this. Jesus then says, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. To, that are pleasing to him. This is a sinless man. I mean, how many of us can honestly say that we always do the things that are pleasing to God? Please raise your hands. Do you see why we need Christ and his record? Do you see it? And this ends so beautifully. It says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. There was a response. Many believed in him. They saw that this ain't no ordinary man. Their hearts became illuminated and they could see the beauty behind the statements that Christ was making. At one time, they were in darkness. But now Christ has so shone on them, they can now see the glorious light of the gospel. This is the Messiah, the I Am the light that the prophet spoke of. He is perfect and we need him. This should be our response to him daily. Let us never forget how much we need Christ. The church, the question is, have you believed in him? Have you believed in him? Amen. She said, yes. <laughs> I love it. But if you have believed in him, guess what? He now tells you, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. Wow. 
So not only have you been saved, not only have you become witnesses and ambassadors, they call you the light of the world. So just as the moon reflects the sun, which is the true source of light, so now you are to reflect Christ and let your light shine. The question is then to you who believe, how are you reflecting his light? In your workplace, in your homes, in your friendship circles, in your families, how are you reflecting his light? I'll leave you with that thought as I read this final passage to close in 1 John 1, 5 to 7. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let your light then, church, shine. It's amazing, today is Father's Day. I have to use one of my favorite verses because it, it so goes with the theme of this. And on the day, Jesus says, let your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light, your light shine, church. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your Son to redeem us. And Lord Jesus, thank you for inviting us to follow you, O oh, light of the world. Thank you so much, Lord, for the understanding of you, the knowledge of you. Lord, I pray that this will not go over our heads, Lord but that we will really comprehend what great privilege it is to be redeemed, adopted, and even be called the light of the world, reflecting your light, Lord. Help us shine your light so bright so that men will see us, Lord, our good works, and give you glory, O Father who is in heaven. Lord, thank you for delivering your word. Thank you for the privilege and honor that we even have the chance and the time to open up your word and study it, Lord. Holy Spirit, continue to illuminate our hearts as we go through this book in John. And let us see you, Christ. Let us see you. We give you praise, glory, and honor now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, church. We're now going to spend some time in communion. And I just want us to prepare our hearts. What a powerful message we have heard uh, this morning. And I want to remind us that it's easy to, to hear a sermon like that. And the next day, forget this sermon. It's, it's, it's easy to, to hear sermons preached to you and then later on, forget everything that was spoken of. And so I, wanna, I just want to remind you um, of the great God that we have who is the light of the world. But I also want to remind you of the light that now lives in those who trust in him. It's easy to forget. And that's why we're told even in communion that every time we meet, remember Christ in this way. Because we forget. It's really and truly we should be celebrating and remembering communion every single time we meet for men's Bible studies, for sisterhood, for church services, because it's easy for us to be Christians and yet forget what Christ has done in us. Uh, so thank you, David, for sharing such a powerful word to us. But church, I want to urge you not to forget this message. Go home, take this passage, meditate on it, memorize it, believe it, and live it out. Amen? Amen. So we come together now for communion. Thank you, Joyce. And this is a time where we remember the body of Christ, which 
was brutally broken for you and I. And it's a time where we remember his blood which was shed for us. And so before we come, we recognize that communion is a time for believers, people who have trusted in Jesus, people who have seen this light and now have this light. They've trusted in Jesus. And maybe for parents here, you might have uh, children who are with you. I know the, children are not, the children have not come back yet. Uh, but maybe you're, you're next to your child and, and you believe that they too have trusted in the Lord Jesus. They can also partake in uh, communion. But before we do that, let's just still our hearts. The reason why we are here today is because of Jesus' body and his blood being broken for us. The reason why we have hope even in this difficult world is because of what Jesus has done for us. Everything, the whole Christian faith rest on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is no small thing we're doing here. But as David was speaking, it just reminded me of Christ and his light that will never go dim. But I do recognize that in our hearts, maybe a light has, has been dimmed. We, we no longer see him or worship him as the light that he is. We're no longer excited about this light that we have in us. And we no longer share the light that we have in us. I want the Lord just to speak to your heart this morning. I want you to remember his body. I want you to remember his blood. I want you, remem I want you to remember that there is hope for you. I know people are struggling with various different things. And it's easy to see Jesus as the light of the world. Many of you might be around danger, have seen danger, have come from danger. As David spoke, there is no danger in this light. Maybe there's no light in you because you are holding a lot of unforgiveness in your heart. People have hurt you and you've, you're struggling to forgive people. I want you now just to ask the Lord to help you to forgive those who have hurt you. Maybe you, you're struggling to see this light because your eyes have been blinded. Your eyes are occupying, occupied by seeing a lot of darkness. You love worldly things. You love listening and watching and just indulging yourself with worldly things. And now it's hard for you to see this light. I pray that the Lord will lift the blindfolds off your eyes for you to see him as a light of the world. Or maybe you're struggling to see this light because you believe that you are light and everything is good with you. Things are going well for you. You don't really see the need of the light of the world. I pray that you will see today that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day that we can come to West Croydon Baptist Church. This is your church that you are building. And we know the gates of hell will not prevail. And we've heard from your word and heard from your servant David as he shared with us, Lord, that the enemy has an agenda, and that is that we never see you as the light of the world, that we walk in the darkness that he is in. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you just lift the blindfolds off of people's eyes this morning. People who have been walking in darkness, living a, a lifestyle of darkness and a lifestyle away from you, Lord Jesus, I pray that they will come and see that you truly are the light of the world. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ who have been walking in this light. But maybe recently, Lord, this light has gone dim. Not because you have gone dim, but because of our selfishness, because of our sin and our disobedience. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will forgive my brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we remember you in this way, as we remember your body that was broken for us and your blood that was shed for us, Lord, Help us to truly see and believe that you are the light of the world. In your name, amen. Amen. So church, Jesus 
On the night that he was betrayed, he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you meet. Amen. So friends, when the bread comes round uh, in your own time, please do take and eat and remember uh, the body of Christ which was broken for you. And also as the cup comes round, I just want you to hold the cup and we will drink together as a church community. Thank you. Awesome, church. If you're able to stand with me, let's stand with the cup. And please do turn to the person that you like next to you and just say that the blood of Christ is shed for you and I. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, church. Uh, so just... Uh, before we take up our offerings and have our closing song, I just want to welcome uh, a new member of ours. Reese, can you please come up? Uh, so so Reese has become a member here. And uh, we just want to pray for Reese um, and just pray that the Lord will continue to use him um, and just guide him and bless him and, and hopefully that we can be a huge encouragement to Teresa's discipleship. I was going to say that we normally give um, church, uh, new church members money, but we have had to tie on the budget a bit, so uh, not, not this week, not this week, so sorry. But let's pray for him. If you want to reach your hands towards him, let's reach your hands towards him. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for my brother, Reese, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you love him so much and you died for him, Lord. I thank you for the, the nine months, Lord, that you have saved him and He's come to the knowledge of who you are and his life has just been transformed and you will continue, continuing, Lord, to transform his life, Lord. And I just thank you for my brother. I pray, Lord, he'll be set apart. I thank you so much that he's seen the light that David has preached about this morning, Lord. And I pray he will continue to run towards you, Lord. That he will never again walk in darkness. He will turn his back from darkness and consistently hold on and grab and embrace Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And help us as a church to pray for Reese, to disciple him, to encourage him, and at times even to rebuke him, Lord. But help us to love him the same way that you loved him, Lord. Help us to care for him. He's yours now. And nothing, nothing, Lord, will break that away, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. That's you. Awesome. So we're going to continue to worship the Lord through our offerings, and I'm going to invite a senior and the team to lead us in our last song. Thank you. I you to stand if you are able to.
Amen, church. Please be seated. Thank you so much, worship team. I uh, just want to give a few shout outs. Just can we put our hands together for our wonderful worship team today? Thank you so much. It's not easy to do what they do. Uh, our team at the back, our AV team, keeping things moving. Thank you so much. Welcoming team, coffee team, people serving in the offering, thank you all so much. It really takes a family to put the a service together. So in the midst of it, we thank our Father God. Just want to ask out there, is there any new faces, any visitors with us today? Please, we don't want to embarrass you. We just want to acknowledge and make you feel welcome. Ah, uh, oh, thank you. Oh, nice. Lovely to welcome. We have a small gift for you. Um, just some lots of goodies in there. Uh, we've got a voucher in there in case you're interested in your bookstore. Please speak to Sadie or Esther. Um, and we've got one more over here. Thank you so much. Very warm welcome to you. Please speak to anyone. You can come and speak to me if you want um, after the end of the service. And we would love to hopefully see you again. Thank you so much. And our familiar friends as well. Thank you, Arnold and Cindy, old friends. <laughs> He's looking embarrassed. <laughs> uh, church, who's had a blessed time today? Amen. Lovely time worshiping God this morning. And I just want to, as we close, I uh, just want to read these words out to you again. Um, it's from Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. And it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Uh, church, uh, let's just, as we stand for the grace, um, let's say our closing prayer. Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for being in our midst uh, today. At the start of the service, we prayed for you to come down, and we expected to meet with you, and we trust that we have done that. So, Father, Lord, as, you've, as we've heard your word today, Lord, um, through David, your, your servant, I just pray, Lord, that we don't just listen to it and forget it, Lord, because it's so easy to forget. So, Father, through the monotony and the day-to-day -day of our weeks, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you speak to us through your word, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be bold. Help us, Lord, to give us courage, Lord, as we be the light of the world wherever we walk, wherever, wherever that's in our family lives, wherever our workplace, in our community, wherever we walk, Lord. Let them see our lives, Lord, not what we say. And they say that man or woman is a child of God. And the Father, we ask all these things for, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much, church. Stay around, say hello to someone, have tea and coffee, and be blessed. And we love to see you again next week. Bless you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give him peace. Gracious to you.